So welcome, maybe just a greeting from everyone in the room. I'm Joy and I'm zooming in from Wyoming from the um, Grand Teton National Park. Amanda, do you wanna introduce yourself next and pass sure. it to sure. someone else? Sure, I'm Amanda Singer and I am uh, from Portland State University and Saybrook University. I normally live in Oregon, but I'm currently in California. Shayla? Hello everyone, my name is Shayla Betts and I am calling in from the Richmond, Virginia area. Janet? Hi, I'm Janet Gerson and I'm in New York City calling in. And Tiffany. Hi everyone, my name is Tiffany and I'm based in St. Peter, Minnesota. And Tiffany, can you see who's, who else is here? Um, I guess Hero didn't go yet. Welcome Hello. Hero. Yeah, I'm Hero. Um, I'm actually a college student right now and I'm in Illinois. Welcome. And Julie. So we'll just welcome Julie. I think she's unmuted, looking for the button, which you know I can fully understand with my technological challenges today. So, so I think we can begin. Glad to see you all here, and uh, glad that we have this chance to, instead of being at PGSA in Milwaukee, which I wish we were in, that we we're able to um, join together. And uh, so all of us are gonna take different takes on this topic of the use and abuse of anger for social change, but all of us, just to let you all know, are thinking about anger as a justified response to injustice and as a force of change. So that's what brings us all together. And I'm gonna specifically be talking about feminist takes on emotion. Um, Shayla and Amanda and I met and we were like, well, you know, what order should we go in or what might be the most useful way to use this time? And uh, I have thought a, a bunch about feminist interpretations of emotions. And so I thought that I would set the stage a little bit of like, well, how do feminists rework emotions and how might that be useful when we consider how anger is a source of change? So <clears throat> I take from some people like write so much about what is, a, what is an emotion? What is anger? And I take from Sarah Ahmed, that's an image of her, um, and she's a recent author of Living a Feminist Life, which I really recommend. And she talks about emotions, she's a philosopher, and she talks instead of about thinking about, you know, what are emotions, she thinks about what can emotions do? What do they do as a practice? And as feminists, as you all know, uh, those of you, any kind of social justice and critical interpretation is doing both a critique and a possibility. And so the critique of what emotions do, feminists have suggested, you know, in my review, at least three moves that I think are useful to consider. Um, so they're undoing some of our Western inheritance of what emotions mean. So the three things that um, Ahmed suggests, uh, actually a lot of feminists suggest, is that emotions have been inherited in Western conceptions as dichotomous to reason, which we're gonna destabilize and as natural, natural force often located in an individual and attached to emotional individuals instead of social political practices. And so let's rework those oops, a little bit. The first one, thinking about a danger of dichotomies, um, feminists and, and I'm basically the challenge with dichotomies as you all know, is that they simplify complex reality. And I'm actually gonna simplify a little bit just to show how these dichotomies can sometimes work. And so you have, the, you have this complex world that's divided into twos. So men and women, masculinity, femininity, emotion, reason, um, whiteness, people of color, any of these divisions actually simplify reality. And the challenge is once you've simplified them into two, makes room for practicing domination so that one becomes elevated and the other um, devalued. And so we have this emotional rational divide and the problem with that, there's many problems with that, it's like untrue, but it also does work. And one of the things that it can do is it can devalue actively that which is not considered reasonable. And so if you think about these lists that I put in there, masculine, feminine, white, BIPOC, civilized, colonized, the, the one that is more associated with emotionality and naturalness is devalued within Western historical discourse. And this is not just um, 
a problem for stereotypes and for discrimination, but it can become encoded and has been encoded to actually mark people who have less access to reason to not having access to liberation and to political rights. So, you know, it was literally used to reinforce um, the legality of slavery and women not having access to vote and people being colonized subjects. And so, and Patricia um, Williams is somebody that's written really eloquently about that. So a move that we can do, especially when we're considering anger is collapse the dichotomy and just recognize that there's a plurality of emotions and we can't really, we can't consider emotions as something both dichotomous to reason, but also in categories that are good and bad. And so if we're gonna guess what goes into the category of bad for emotions, is it good or bad? Um, particularly um, some of us within peace, uh, like peace communities and conflict transformation folk, too often I think consider anger as a bad emotion or something that is devalued. And so instead, if we start thinking about what, how emotion is a force for change, and that it can be actually quite enlivening and brings attention to injustice and challenges it. A few examples, we have Patricia Williams, and I was just kind of talking about how she talked about encoding uh, marginalization. And she, I don't know if you all know her, uh, her blog, it's called Diary of a Mad Law Professor. And she suggests that rage can be used as a theoretical tool. And if you haven't checked out her, her work, definitely look there, it's in the nation. Um, and it's just, she basically recognizes that yeah, my, my rage actually helps me do my theorizing. Another person that is exemplary of like a huge amount of um, writing and activism that has been mobilized by anger, um, eloquent rage. And Brittany Cooper, and in relationship to Black liberation, thinks of rage as a superpower. And I think, Amanda, you're going to talk more about social movement organizing and social work or social change work mobilized by anger. And then the third image is to suggest the art and creativity that can come from anger. Um, but I was suggesting that we don't wanna say, oh, anger, good. Oops, sorry, guys. I just gonna have to go back here. Um, anger, good, right? It's not, it's not like we're just flipping this dichotomy, we're actually collapsing it. And so Audre Lorde is somebody that suggests um, she's been really influential probably to all three of us. And she, she suggests that the challenge of um, the use of anger is one of, the, one of the things to avoid is to have it be a stance against the world. So emotion, when it's signifying and response to oppression is really powerful. And we have to be careful to not let it fossilize or become something that we just, that we just carry in contrast to that we're using to point out the contradictions in this world. So the second thing I'd like to um, point to that feminists destabilize in terms of Western inheritance of emotions is oftentimes emotions within our Western discourses and Western frameworks are seen as natural and internal to the individual. And you know that volcano image of it just erupting out of us um, or fire or a lot of different kinds of metaphors for anger suggest something attached to naturalness and to something that just comes out of us. And, you know, in some ways that makes sense because we experience emotions in our physicality. And so we experience them within our bodies. And one of the things that we really want to point to today is to think about if it is seen as something that's inside us and natural, that's just erupting, that that can relate to being outside of the scope of change. So something that's natural is just like, well, just happens, right? And so we have to also, if something is natural that we're witnessing, we might take it a little less seriously than if it is um, coming from an interpretation of limits in the world or an interpretation of an injustice. And that is a relational conception of, of anger. As an example of that, um, I don't know if you all know Sarah Ahmed. She's one of, I was just mentioning her from um, The Feminist Life. She has, a, um, she has an image that she's called the feminist killjoy, which I really like. Of course, my name's Joy, so I'm probably attached a little bit to it because I think of it as something that is really a helpful figure. Um, I'll tell you a story exemplifying feminist killjoy. So imagine that you're at a holiday dinner and you're with family 
And somebody that you, you know, like, I don't know, an auntie or an uncle or somebody that is like the problematic figure says something that is contributing to the diminishment of someone else based on structures of violence. So homophobic comment or racist or sexist, any of these kinds of holiday lovely <laughs> chatter, right? So if I point that out, right, and I say, yeah, that's really problematic and, that, and this is why I'm going to challenge it. And if we think of that as attached to me, instead of it being that I'm pointing to a problem, I can become the problem, right? So I am killing the joy, right? So the, there was like this attachment to what other people accept. It's okay to say racist, sexist things or have that kind of an action that you witness. And so by pointing that out, you can become a killjoy, like challenging the comfort that's happening that people are willing to accept that kind of injustice. And so, you know, kind of claiming that figure is really helpful for me because I am somebody that really loves to connect to people and to have people um, being in connection with others. And so to claim that feminist killjoy, perhaps as another example of a superpower, I think can be really helpful to think, well, this is worth it. So I'm not asking people to be attached to the happiness of injustice. I'm actually or comfort in the status quo. I'm actually thinking I'm gonna be using that power perhaps with force, sometimes even with anger that can disrupt the status quo, can disrupt the naturalness if it's okay to have these kinds of patterns of domination. So I'm gonna do one more critique that feminists suggest. And uh, that is from moving from emotional individuals to thinking about collective uptake. And this is something that um, emotions can be considered. Alison Jagger is the feminist that talks about this. She names anger as an outlaw emotion. And it's particularly an outlaw emotion for those, those historically attached to emotion, those categories that I was mentioning before, women, people of color, folks that have less access to reason thought, but also to um, political power. If those folks, those historical othered people claim emotions, it is an outlaw emotion. And in fact, anger is the only emotion that is not feminized in Western discourse. So women are attached to all emotions in contrast to anger, except when women are expressing anger on behalf of someone else. But if we are claiming our power and expressing emotions as women, that is definitely an outlaw emotion. And it's really challenging to hear. Um, so those that get dismissed historically are particularly significant and important for us to listen to, especially for those that are pointing out injustice and, and pointing it out with anger. And so I think that we have a responsibility to sustain the encounters of people who are asking and demanding attention and, and using anger to point out injustice or to demand change. And it's challenging. Um, and so I'm gonna also remind us that learning from the anger of others can be a practice of liberation. I think it's almost easier to imagine. So like if I saw Amanda or Shayla expressing anger, I would just be like, that's great go because you know we share an agenda of change but we're it's complicated we can't step outside of this world and so it's not only that we all carry all parts of um, the kinds of structures that diminish others and so when i have to pay attention to listening to the anger of others is particularly when i'm implicated in that anger and so if i'm implicated meaning that i have an, either benefited from the, the lack of change, or perhaps I'm just implicit in it. You know? So like um, carrying a white body and I'm implicit in racism. If I hear people calling that out, even to me, how do I sustain that interaction? In the contrast to being defensive, hey, I just did a, uh, a presentation on anger and I, I love I love how anger can, you know, I'm not the one you should be angry at. I mean, all those kinds of defensive kinds of moves that would put the attention more on me in contrast to what is being claimed as needing change. And so I think that's a practice that is important to think about. Um, Adrian Marie Brown talks a little bit about fractal practice, which I really like. So if we're thinking about social change on structural levels, 
actually, if we practice it in our interpersonal life, it might be a fractal practice. So making room for paying attention to emotions and listening long enough for new interpretations to be possible is something that we can practice. And we can um, try to like build our muscles in, in making that something that is possible to sit through and to take seriously. I'll end with a story from Audre Lorde. Um, and she's like, I think one of the most, the, there was a recent signs, it's a feminist journal that had discussions on how feminists interpret rage as power. And every single essay talked about this essay. You know, she's just, the use of anger is something that's been incredibly influential to all of, all of us that take anger seriously. And she's, she was writing this in the 80s, and she was at a, you know, national conference, kind of like PGSA, but it was a, uh, a women's studies conference. And in this conference, she noticed there's this panel of white women, yet again, and no people of color who were represented. And she was angry. And so she expressed anger. So it's like, this is unacceptable. And a white woman in the audience, so she tells the story, was like, you know, Audrey, um, if you could speak less harshly about racism, I'm going to be able to hear you. So really, can you kind of diffuse your anger so that I can have social, so I can uptake your message? And her response um, is that, is it my manner that keeps her from hearing or the threat of a message that her life might change? And I think of that in terms of remembering that anger is not necessarily just a response to a past, to an event or to uh, ongoing past harm, but it suggests that it can open a different future. And that is the power of emotion, that it can invite new possibilities and perhaps a world that's more worthy of being attached to. So, Thank you all. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and invite you to, if there's any comments or questions on my share, and then we'll pass it to Shayla. And then any questions or anything that comes up? Janet, did you have a comment? No, thank you. I, I, I want to hear it all together before okay. commenting because I, I love it has this a energy. rolling momentum, I think, and I want to catch the wave. Okay, awesome. Let's ride the wave. Does anyone have a question or anything that you'd like to me to clarify before we move on and go and start riding that wave that, that, wave that Janet's suggesting? Um, this is Julie, and I do have just a thought that's going through my mind as we go forward, and that is that as a white woman and doing anti-racist work and research, I, some, I have a great deal of anger about health inequity and the systemic health inequity, but I have often found, and it's something I'm, I'm thinking about, that I'm sometimes the angry person in a group where there are people of color that have far more reason to be angry than I do, but they are not expressing, I'm the one expressing the anger. And it's come, and this is something I would be interested if one of you talked to during your talk, does is what's going on sometimes that it's like I have the white privilege to be angry. Mm -hmm. And that's that's something I've thought about more lately. Like, is it like an example of white privilege? Yeah, you can be angry whenever you want. It doesn't you know, cause any threat to your life, um, into your social interactions. And there's so it's actually. I, does, does this make sense what I'm, yes. what I'm saying? So, it does. And I, I see Shayla nodding. And so yeah, she's going to get a chance to address that. Have to think about what that feels like. Yeah. If it sometimes feels like, oh, it sounds like you're on our side, but you're, I'm also getting these vibes about, yes, Miss White Privilege, you can say whatever you want, wherever you want. And um, so I'm, I'm really, I guess I'm in the, position of reflecting on that. I, yeah. I want to know more and have some insight so I can maybe control that or yeah. deal with it differently. Well, I'll make a comment and then we can move to Shayla and then, you know, I'll, I'll or I think, 
I saw Amanda writing that down for us to have some dialogue on that and kind of develop some collective wisdom. I mean, it seems like absolutely being attentive to wait, am I, am I expressing this rage because I'm expressing my white privilege? And to be attentive to that, I don't think there's an answer to that, um, but I have, I have a, couple, a couple things to think about. One might be to like reflect on it and go, what would this feel like if I was, if it was all, it was largely women and there was a man that was expressing rage on sexism, um, what would that feel like? I mean, I sometimes will do these kind of comparisons just to kind of get this felt sense of that, right? Is there something that would feel problematic for you or not? Right. Um, and then, you know, there is something about really paying attention to what feels troubling you know, kind of trusting your intuition is like, huh, I'm thinking I might be taking up space. Maybe perhaps I am, right? Or, or checking in or just like, re I just love how you're holding that curiosity. I think that's what's really important is to be very attentive and curious because we can absolutely take up space if we have more social power without intending to. And it can deflect attention on those that are most impacted by the structures that we're challenging, right? And I also was just listening to an interview with Cooper, who's thinking about rage as a superpower, and was talking about, actually, there are times when she wants to express rage about racism, and she's not able to, because it would, you know, she was talking about a friend, I think, uh, because she was worried about uh, losing her job, right? And so there are times, actually, that it's not safe to express your rage, Um she also was suggesting find a place to express your rage, right? But so that we don't want to internalize it and then have it fossilized within us um, because it's always important to express it. And sometimes it's not safe to. So there really might be in a situation where you're being in solidarity with somebody and taking on that weight of, I'm going to, I'm going to be the feminist killjoy or the, uh, you know, the um, anti-racist killjoy and speak up. Um, so that in fact might be an act of solidarity or it might not. Right. And so I trust you to, I trust you because you're asking that question. It's a really important question. And thank you. Um, let's move to Shayla. Shayla, I'm looking forward to hearing your insights. Okay. Um, well, thank you. And um, I'm excited to be here today to kind of talk about um, the development of anger, especially as it relates to our social justice work. So my focus will be um, focusing on when pain turns into anger. Um, and for those of you who don't know me, I am a licensed clinical social worker. I work as a therapist um, and I teach the next generation of social workers. And a lot of what I do has a centered in that emotional expression, that emotional experience. Um, and I tell my students a lot as they are learning to interact with clients and developing those skills, that it's important for us to know what is our emotional response or our emotional reaction to what we are working with or being exposed to or helping. Because it's important for us to know that as that's how we build our levels of self-awareness, that's how we maintain our boundaries, that's how we know when and how to engage in self-care and how to keep ourselves that we are in our best place to help and support others. And so when we are especially working in activism, right, we are often facing and trying to alleviate that which we're already experiencing. So we're already carrying so much and we're looking the monster in the eye and saying, but I'm still going to defeat you. And there is something that brought us to this work. And a lot of times, maybe not always, but a lot of times it is some level of harm or discomfort or pain that has brought us there. And over time, after that repeated exposure and the stuff that we're carrying, we get angry, we get tired, we get frustrated, right? And so from a clinical standpoint, we often view anger as a secondary emotion and that there is something deeper there. And then um, it's often expressed as anger, especially if we're not able to express it in other ways. And so for that reason, I'm, I'm approaching this very intentionally in that I don't want to use a lot of graphics or PowerPoints or things like that, because when we really talk about pain, when we talk about anger, it is so raw and it's very hard to capture that in more of a formal presentation. Um, so I want to give life and, and um, honor that rawness, 
because in how we choose to express that pain and that anger comes a lot of vulnerability. And with vulnerability, that's really just strength and showing that I am here, I'm fully present and being open like that. You know, we're opening ourselves to whatever may come at us. Um, and that's strong. And that's why we do this work. Um, and then another perspective that I have is especially when we're doing this work, um, I'm um, focusing on anti-racist programming. And what I notice is that when we are going through and we're having these difficult conversations, it's so easy to say, oh, I know, you know, people who do that, or how do I tell somebody about da da da? And it's very hard for us to center ourselves in the work and say, hmm, is this true of me? Is this how I'm carrying myself? What about my experience do I want to sit with? And so for that, blending those two, I'm going to really focus and own my portion um, and, and what I carry. And it is my hope that in what I share may be, be applicable to you, where you will also really start to think, what am I really feeling and what am I carrying? And how do I find that balance? How do I find those constructive ways um, to, to release it, to heal from it, and to continue to act? Um, and so I will share that I'm originally from Columbus, Ohio, right? And as you can tell, skin pigment my hair, I'm black, okay? And I am proud to be black. Um, but growing up in the suburb of Columbus where I'm from, um, I was one of very, very few black families um, with the exception of, you know, my grandfather's church, which was 45 minutes from our home. I really didn't know any black families, especially in my community. And so growing up, I had this awareness that I was being taught how to keep myself safe to the best of my ability living in Columbus, Ohio and really the white man's world, okay? And so what that meant for a young black child growing up in the 90s was that I um, had to learn how to dress, how to carry myself, how to speak, how to act, especially when I'm not at home. There are certain ways that you can act there are certain ways that you appear and that there are a lot of stereotypes that are telling people how I'm supposed to behave. And I will break all of those. Um, I will get an education because for a black family, that's how you advance. That's something people can't take from you. Um, I was taught to be aware of the Confederate flag. That is not safe, right? Your physical safety may be in jeopardy. Here's how you handle yourself if you see one go the other way, or if you can't get out of the situation, here's what you do. And to be cognizant that just because a, flat, a Confederate flag may not be on display does not mean that that is not still the beliefs of the people that you're interacting with. And so um, as I was turning 12, we moved to Hampton, Virginia. And that was the first time that I saw, I could easily walk out my door and see people who looked like me. And we weren't scattered about there. Like you're the strong black community. I said, this is awesome. But it's also when I really started to recognize that you know, racism looks different in different places. For instance, like I said, the Confederate flag in Ohio was, you are not saved. I moved to Virginia and that was not the rhetoric. It's like, oh no, it was just Southern pride, right? You're not in harm's way. Um, and it was in Virginia that I experienced the most covert and overt racism, where I had the microaggressions. Oh, you're so articulate, or I'm just gonna touch your hair. I just have to touch it, right? Or, you know, I was a school social worker working in a middle school and the parents assumed even though I have my bag, I'm carrying my clipboard, I'm walking them to my office, it's not until we sit down at the meeting where they say, oh, I thought you were a student. And I'm looking at them like, I'm 27 years old. I do not look 12. <laughs> I'm not in the sixth grade. I'm not walking to somebody else's office, you know, and just, just the surprise. And it just started to build over time. Um, and then it was when um, my boiling point where I was like, I can no longer deny the anger that I have is when I was a school social worker still, I was working at one of my elementary schools and the white female principal um, kept calling this 10 year old black child a future statistic. And I explained to her how egregiously problematic that was, especially for a white woman to predetermine this 10 year old's life. And when I explained to her the harm that can come from saying that to him, saying that about him, she continuously looked me in my eye and continued to call him a future black statistic, waiting for me to fulfill all of those black stereotypes, which one had side of me said, oh, we ready. <laughs> but that other side of me said, no, you know what? I'm not gonna stoop to that because I was taught to be different, 
right? And so that's when my anger really surfaced. And from there, initially I had that response where, you know, I need to stay because the school is predominantly black and brown. And I said, who else is going to come in and recognize what's happening and be willing to speak up for it just about every time like I would. And while I do respect my other school social workers that had different placements, I was one of maybe three or four Black school social workers. And it takes a lot as a Black person to speak up. Um, and Julie, to your point when you were sharing about how sometimes even when you're in this environment where there are other people of color and they're not speaking up, we are exhausted. And I don't, I don't speak for every person of color, but from my experience, I am exhausted. I am tired. And I have learned that in this work, I have to protect myself by choosing what I share and how I share because I can't <laughs> address every single one because then that would be all that I do. Um, and so in saying that, I was then invited to um, teach at a university. And so I did decide to um, leave school social work because I thought I would have a greater influence impacting the next generation of social workers than I did staying at at this school, because I was thinking about all the students who I would touch, who I could then encourage to develop these anti-racist beliefs and then all the clients they would touch. But it was at my last year in this institution, or the end of my first year, I should say, not my last year, not going, I'm not leaving yet, but the end of my first year at this institution um, that I had, to me, the most egregious racial attack that I had experienced to date. And that is when I was wearing one of my very pretty head wraps and um, a white woman in my program told me that I need to take that rag off of my head, that it was a poor excuse for not maintaining proper grooming, that I shouldn't wear the brown one because it blended in with my skin tone and made me look bald, but the white one is pretty. I can wear the white one. And even after explaining to her or attempting to explain the reason for the cultural head wrap, that is cultural expression, what it symbolized in African culture, the way we styled it, the side of the head it was on, the position, the size. Uh, she repeatedly called it a rag and attacked me saying that it was poor grooming, that I had not appropriately groomed myself and that I instead wore a rag to hide that my hair was disheveled. And that's when the rage set in. <laughs> and so it was difficult because growing up, I had this constant, pain, which we never really called it pain because it's just the experience of a Black person growing up in America, trying to stay safe. And over this time, especially with the current society we're in with all the violence against people of color, not just in the form of police brutality, but in the microaggressions, in the overt racism, in everything that builds up, right? I love that my family taught me how to keep myself safe to the best of my ability. But what I'm sitting with now as an almost 32 year old is that it's not just about how do I keep myself safe, it's figuring out how can I survive in this space. And so that fall, I went to a um, two day workshop on anti-racist programming and it was there that my empathy was born because it was a diverse group of people. It was a lot of white people. It was people of color, which were mostly black people. Um, and there were so many intense expressions of white racial affect, white fragility, white guilt, white shame. And it was very triggering and re-traumatizing to the black people there. And there were several expressions of that. And to me, I still see that we had very justified anger and harm and hurt. But in our expressing that, when we're already seeing this white fragility, white shame, and white guilt, it was also harming to the white people. And I think it was one of my first experiences where I'm still in a room full of white people. I'm planning my escape route, but knowing even if I leave this conference, there's nowhere I can go that's safe. And so I stayed because in that moment, even though I was unsafe, even though I was triggered and traumatized, I was still very grateful in that moment that I was black because I could only imagine what the white people in that room felt to be shamed, to feel guilt, to be scared, even if it seemed unjustified because, you know, as Robin DeAngelo puts it, white people are not unsafe when we talk about race, but they felt unsafe. 
And then if they are scared of us Black people for almost no reason, because we haven't done anything, right? And then we are expressing our anger to people who are scared of our anger. That was a very interesting dynamic. And so it was there, I said, that was when my empathy was born because I said, we need to address this, but we need to address this in a way that is not harming to people. And so flash forward, I'm now, you know, working on my doctoral program and I'm studying anti-racist pro uh, programming and I'm studying white racial experiences and white racial affect. And I want to understand what is that experience and how can we um, provide programming, anti-racist programming that while some expression of shame and guilt and fragility will always be there, right? And we understand that. How do we use it in a healthy way to still progress the conversation without having that complete shutdown? And so I say that to say that for me, I find healing in this work. I'm very hurt and I'm very harmed, but I feel I have an empathetic spirit. And so in understanding that, which I don't naturally understand, I'm able to address my pain and I'm able to work through it. And it's not to say I don't get triggered or I don't get angry because I do. <laughs> and that side of me comes out because I'm still human, right? And I'm allowing myself to sit with that. And I'm refusing that, that label of the angry black woman, even though black women have every right to be angry, okay? And so I recognize that as we continue to be exposed to the pain, you must also continue to engage in our healing. Because as you may hear people say, healing is the highest form of resistance. So as we are feeling like we are becoming defeated, we are still going on. But the only way to sustain that is to recognize what is really behind the anger. What is behind the discomfort? And how am I using that? And so it's important to re remind ourselves, as my father-in-law reminded me this weekend, any road will take you to your destiny if you don't know where you're going. So we want to be intentional about what is it that is behind the anger? How are we using it? How is it appropriate for us to use it? And then we got to stay grounded in that, stay strong, stay focused, find our support, and we just got to keep going on and heal in the process. So that's me. Thank you so much. Are there any questions or any comments that anybody would like to share or anything that I can explain a little bit more? My only comment is gratefulness, Shayla, for like the vulnerable, I mean, you de demonstrated what you're speaking, you know, to be vulnerable and share the stories as part of your healing. So experienced it as a gift and appreciative. Any questions for folks or comments? I really um, enjoyed that, Shayla. This is Julie. And one of the things I've learned just in the work I've done, you know, growing up white in America, and I'm over 60, I, um, the depth, and I see it now with you, and I haven't met anyone I haven't seen it with now, the depth of the pain is phenomenally more than most white people I know have a clue about. They have, they are seriously clueless and well, they, by design, they want to be clueless. I mean, it's, it's out there to be seen, you know, uh, the black lives matter, everything that happened with George Floyd and on and on and on and on since 65 and, um, but they don't want to see it at all. And it's so much more serious. So that's some of where my rage comes from with white people that aren't, anti-racist because they, they're not racist, so they don't have to deal with it, right? Um, according to them, is, is that they, it's just so extreme, it's so bad. And that's somebody like you, you know, that has this wonderful life. If, you know what I mean? Like you don't, it's just being black in the United States of America. You don't have to grow up in like horror, you know, a horrible situation. You just have to be black to suffer so much pain because it's it's when a whole society is like this. And I just don't know what to do with the rage I feel toward, I know a lot of um, 
I would say right wing type white people in my orbit, you know, like relatives. And it's just, and I, I have had many, uh, I stand up for it. I figure that's the place to show my rage appropriately. But they, they're just absolutely in cement in terms of not moving. And uh, it's, it's just shocking every day to me. And would you like a response to what you shared, Julie? Yes. For me, if I may, I would challenge you to sit in that rage and see what's underneath it. Um, and to really look internally, not in looking just at the people you know and how they act and how they respond. But why is it so sensitive to you? What is underneath that rage? Um, we know that there's a lot um, of study about internalized racism and horizontal racism. Um, and I've experienced that growing up. Like um, when I moved to Hampton, Virginia, there were individuals who, you know, my peers, the first time I had black peers and I'm excited, I'm gonna have black friends. And I didn't because they were so mean and they called me an Oreo because I was black on the outside or white on the inside or I acted white or I really was white, but um, to convince people I was black after I showered, I have to jump in a bucket of tan paint and, you know, so I would be black again and things like that. And so it was really this internalized um, aggression, this internalized message that they had against themselves that was portrayed and kind of projected onto me, right? And so that's kind of the, um, the meaning of that internalized racism, right? And that horizontal racism where the same messages that we get from society, we then put on others who look like us as a way of othering. And so one thing that is challenging is that what I'm noticing in my research um, especially those people who are so into anti-racist programming, I see that they're still looking at, oh, because I know white people who do this, or I know that. But I think a large portion of that is to really challenge, where am I in this? It's easy to look at other people and how they present, but where do I sit? And what does that mean for me? Is there something internally where I think I got it all, but maybe I'm still understanding? And then we need to show us that grace in what else can I explore about me and how might that impact my read? Maybe that's my healing. Have I forgiven myself? If I feel like I'm carrying this shame about just being white and it's not something you asked for, just like I didn't ask to be black, but what else is there? Maybe, right? Maybe that's it. Maybe it's not, but I would explore what is underneath that rage and what is it that that's really channeling and right when you hit that that's where a lot of that healing can come that's my perspective thank you that's very interesting and i would agree with that you know it where it came when i was a very young like a fourth grader i was i'm german so and i'm we're not we're from germany a couple generations ago not i'm not didn't come from germany per se but um, I, I spent years studying the Holocaust because I was so guilty about being a German, even though my ancestors came way before the Holocaust. And then that just transferred over time to African-Americans. I, I think it's a personality trait of when a thing is wrong, it's wrong. And when it's wrong, I can't live with it. I just have to call it out. And of course, this racism is is just dead, dead wrong. So, so allow that you know, self, that time to sit with that, to show yourself grace, and to work through that. We channel that into our actions. Uh, I think about Robin D'Angelo, and I'm going to stop so Amanda can go on. But <laughs> um, uh, Robin D'Angelo, in her book *Nice Racism*, in chapter five, she talks about that. Right? She shares an experience of how there was this very intense um, expression of grief from the black community and the white women there were, you know, crying alongside. And she said, it was in some ways upsetting to me because I can't relate to that. So why am I showing that same level? And so she has suggestions for what does that mean? And how do we have this compassionate response and how do we honor it in a way that's not overshadowing others' experiences? And so that's what came up for me. So if you haven't read De uh, Robin D'Angelo's recent book that came out this year, um, turn to chapter five and maybe that will um, help to give some strategies for how do I sit with that? Because I thought that that was a powerful experience that she shared. Thank you.
Yeah. Appreciate the exchange between you, Shayla, and Julie. So um, we're going to uh, move over to Amanda. And again, we'll have time for some responses. And then we're going to open it to full dialogue. So if you think about questions that are emerging from um, all of the shares, that'd be great. Amanda. Thank you. Sorry, it took me a minute to find my unmute screen with my screen share. Still having a hard time finding everything I'm looking for here. <laughs> I think you're just finding good company with me, Amanda. So I appreciate it. Right. Yeah. All solidarity in the technical challenges <laughs> of the Zoom world. Hello, everyone, and thank you for your interest in this topic. This is something that um, Joy and I and Shayla have been talking about for a couple of months now and finding these um, overlaps in our, in our interest in our research in this area. And as we were talking about um, our topic of the use and abuse of anger for social change, I thought a lot about the um, notion of destructive and constructive rage. And I teach in the field of conflict resolution. We talk a lot about destructive and constructive conflict. Um, so those are terms that um, give some insight into um, where we have opportunities for movement. So destructive conflict and destructive rage are often um, areas that there isn't a lot of opportunity for movement per se, because they tend to be destabilizing in such a way that they don't gain momentum, they don't facilitate change. Um, they can be very destructive to our own sense of self and definitely to our own capacity for building the kinds of voice and agency that are necessary to try and craft positive change in the world. So um, that was the basis of my thinking around this topic, like what would constructive rage look like? And in um, doing a lot of reading and consideration around this topic of reimagining rage as something that has the power of construction, I also found, uh, I found some phenomenal new work um, on this topic. I think the Black Lives Matter movement and the scholarship that has accompanied that, um, which is primarily being penned by um, African-American women and other women of color, um, has been phenomenal at doing exactly what Joy has described and what Shayla has described. Pardon me. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Just need to sneeze a bit. Um, in terms of um, really um, leveraging emotion as a key to um, transformation. And so one of the ways that it's spoken about in, um, in the literature is uh, not only constructive rage, but productive rage. How do we use rage to be productive in terms of creating social change? How do we think of it as constructive in terms of the creative process and productive in terms of actually um, um, creating the momentum and the traction for producing change? And um, so that is the basis of what I wanna talk about. And I really just kind of wanna share how people are thinking about this to give us a sense of um, maybe some scaffolding in our own thinking and in our own research and work um, around uh, the power that rage can bring. So um, one of the, um, a lot of people came up with different ways of um, sort of lending words and language and ideas to this notion of um, constructive rage. Uh, Maisha Cherry, who I'll talk more about in a minute, says, anger not only demands that things change, it proclaims that change matters. She's a philosopher who teaches at University of California, Riverside, who just wrote a phenomenal new text. It's actually coming out next week. So I've read a lot of reviews of it and, um, and of her work, but I haven't had the chance to familiarize myself with her newest text. She says, uh, and when change is absent, anger reminds us of its need to exist, which is so beautiful because um, as we're talking about anger, we see that it's not just this emotion that comes out of our own personal process. It's sort of this collective 
dissent from the status quo and uh, something that puts energy behind this potential for change or this need for change. Um, Yolanda Pierce says, in our current and historical movements against the forces of white supremacy, we often fail to examine the constructive rage and righteous anger which undergird the emotions of participants in these movements and which galvanizes the movements itself. So as Joy talks about emotion as being minimized and also feminized in a male dominated patriarchy, um, all, of those, um, all of those categorizations sort of cut the legs out from underneath the power uh, that, that um, anger has to mobilize change. And so as particularly women of color, scholars who are women of color have begun to note, we start to see how, um, how disempowering that is and how we really need to have this reorientation to anger as being truly the lifeblood of social change and of movement making. I've been teaching nonviolence for 25 years at Portland State University. And I always say, what, what are you willing to get up off the couch for, right? Because no one is willing to get out of the comfort of their own couch, watching TV and eating a bag of potato chips unless they are truly enraged. That's what, that's what gets us to literally get up off the couch and to participate in whatever activist undertakings that we feel compelled to participate in. Hopefully something for all of us whether it's in the small sphere of our own lives or in the larger social landscape. Rebecca Traitster says, anger drives the conviction that a better future is possible. So we start thinking about anger, the constructive nature is anger as that which actually possibilizes hope, right? Which is not sort of word on the street about anger, <laughs> right? We don't think about anger as being synonymous with hope synonymous with possibilizing a better future. And yet without that interruption of the status quo, how do we mobilize and move forward and create the kinds of change that we are talking about here in terms of social injustice in a general sense, in terms of anti-racism in a very specific sense. Toni Morrison beautifully describes anger is better. There is a sense of being in anger, a reality and presence, an awareness of worth. It is a lovely surging. So all of these counter descriptions invite us into such a rich reinterpretation of anger as not something to be ashamed of, not something to be um, in reaction with, but something to weave into our response as a means to create change. Viktor Frankl, not a woman of color, <laughs> says between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space, our power to choose our, is our power to choose our response. And in our response lies our growth and our freedom. And this is important because it speaks to the fact that, again, in conflict resolution terminology, we talk about reaction, compared with response. And our reaction is just to burn down the house. Sometimes that's effective. Sometimes that does um, interrupt a process or a community or a um, tradition in such a way as to bring people's attention into new possibility. But in terms of how we weave it into a response, Martin Luther King and Gandhi predicated their movements, not just on love, but on harnessing that righteous anger as a way to do exactly what Viktor Frankl is talking about here, that space between stimulus and response, where we get to cultivate and strategize and leverage the emotional rawness that um, Shayla spoke about. And Yolanda Pierce talks specifically about the Black Lives Matter um, movement being a movement that unapologetically embraces righteous anger and passionate possibilities. So I'm just peppering you with these quotes because I think that they invite us into a whole new language of possibility that supports probably what all of us already know, right? Those of you who I have already met, I know you already know this, whether or not you have the language to describe it, 
and those of you who I haven't met, I'm guessing that this is something that can help enrich the landscape of possibility in your own thinking. Um, and um, as, um, well, I'll get to that at the end, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> So as, as Joy highlighted, um, a lot of the work that's coming out now is rooted deeply in the work of Audre Lorde, so much so that the term Lordian rage is being banded, batted about as a way to describe what it is that we're talking about here. So I might prefer constructive rage because I think that it's more descriptive of um, what it is we're attempting to do. And Audre Lorde um, was certainly uh, a, an agent of change far beyond the work of her expression of rage. So I'm hesitant to promote this particular category, but find it interesting to do so. And some of the ways in which Lord spoke about rage, she said, um, anger expressed and translated into action in service of our vision and our future is a liberating and strengthening act of clarification, right? clarification, for it is the painful process of this translation that we identify who are our allies, with whom we have grave differences, and who are our genuine enemies. Anger is loaded with information and energy. So anger is informative. It teaches us about ourselves. It teaches us about our own ethical belief structures. And it teaches us about who we are in community with and how we forge those relationships, both of alliances and of enemies. And I, you know, I use enemies a little bit tongue in cheek because I don't believe that that's a very effective word for the work that we're doing, but certainly the people for whom we, the people with whom we need to um, exercise more caution or care. Hang on two seconds while I get a tissue because the sneeze is really got the party started here. Amanda, I'm gonna continue reading. Okay. Anger aims for change. It's informed by an inclusive and liberatory perspective, source of energy, serving progress, and serves as collective surgery against exclusion, privilege, stereotyping, and betrayal. Thank you, Joy. So these are all excerpts from um, Audre Lorde's work that speak very specifically to the ways in which anger lends itself to this process. So I'm, I'm just sharing these with you to invite you into this robust thinking. Also, um, a Black queer Buddhist um, by the name of uh, Lama Rod Owens frames this within a Buddhist perspective in his book, Love and Rage. And I wanted to include this because I think we have this very, um, we have this, particularly in the field of conflict resolution and peacemaking, peace building, we have this idea that um, rage is somehow antithetical to peace and, or that anger is somehow antithetical to peace. And so we try and be super chill all the time in a way that is holy, you know, and I love his invitation to think about it from a Buddhist perspective as being so central to the process. And um, so for many Buddhist anger is often thought of as a root cause for suffering and lasting negative repercussions. In American culture at large, anger, particularly among people of color is delegitimized, demonized or supposed to be suppressed. And this reminds me of what Shayla was talking about in terms of how she was raised to, um, to, you know, to follow social expectations to a T so as not to bring attention or shame to herself or to her family or to her heritage, right? And so there's a very small box and um, this gets to um, what Jane was talking about too in terms of the privilege of expressing anger, um, or Julie, sorry, not Jane. Um, so he says, anger is the mental and physical tension we experience between, oops, between being emotionally hurt and determining a strategy of self-care to tend that hurt. The mental and physical tension we experience between being emotionally hurt and determining a strategy of self-care to tend to the hurt, which reminds me very much of Viktor Frankl's sort of framing of anger as being that process in between stimulus and response. 
He says, anger serves as a bodyguard for our personal pain and suffering. When recognized and handled with attention, love, and compassion, it can be a powerful mobilizing factor in our solidarity and commitment to enacting social change. And he says, what is needed is a relationship to the heartbreak of anger that is embodied, non-destructive, and deeply healing for all. And this speaks very much to Shayla's quote that she shared earlier around um, healing is the highest form of resistance, right? So how do, we, how do we have that be the larger box in which we operate um, in our expressions of anger? So in terms of the Black Lives Matters movement, um, Maisha Cherry says, through protest, diverse, through protest, diverse voices are boldly standing up to racial injustice and they are expressing anger while doing it. This rage is not a distraction, nor is it destructive to American ideals. It is playing a crucial role politically and morally in helping us build a better country. And this was something that was true through all protest movements, through all, you know, in the, in the sixties, in the seventies, do we have any protests in the eighties, not in the United States so much, maybe in the nineties and the knots, here we are like really seeing anger as being that which leverages the possibility for change. Um, so I'm, I have a slide here that, that um, tells you of this people who, that I, the people who I've quoted, and I'm happy to share this with anyone who wants to see this, but I wanted to end um, my presentation just talking about Mayusha Cherry's um, um, efforts to come up with a, um, she, she came up with a system of five steps to fight against injustice using anger management. <laughs> and she speaks about anger management, not as being um, managing anger away, but using it strategically in ways that are effective. If we think about anger as being a productive means for change, then how do we maximize that production? And um, in our conversation so far today, one of the things that I was thinking about was this um, orientation to shame versus an orientation to accountability, right? And when we have an orientation to shaming people who have acted poorly, whether it's white people you know, throughout history or activists in a current demonstration, um, oftentimes then that can be alienating and it can be um, disorienting and it can destabilize the process of momentum towards productive and constructive change. But when we encourage an atmosphere of accountability, it's more of an invitation into participation. And um, so I offer that framing, bringing curiosity to how we become accountable instead of looking for the places where blame can rest um, as being a less effective um, change agent. Um, so Maisha Cherry says, um, there's five steps. The first is to express your anger, not to hold it in, to write, create, march, do what you need to do to express that anger um, and mobilize yourself with that anger. And then the second step is to get into solidarity with others like find ways in which to band together with others who are fighting the same fight and to, um, to build that solidarity as a movement for change. The third is to create specific goals so that you're not just thrashing, using the anger to thrash against what is, but to create goals to work toward with, those, um, with the solidarity that you've created. The fourth is to refuse to be policed. And this is not letting other people tell you that you should or shouldn't express your anger or how you can or can't express your anger, not to limit your voice and agency because of social expectation, but to allow yourself to operate authentically toward those goals. And lastly, the fifth is never to be ashamed of your anger. It's an appropriate response to injustice. And that's a really radical, surprisingly radical enticement, right? Never be ashamed of your anger. It's an appropriate response to injustice. So I close with those five steps as a way to think about how we maximize the change momentum that anger invites us into um, 
And I hope that you, like me, can lean into all of the sources that have been shared this um, during this presentation as really dynamic voices that um, that can inspire us into um, a reimagining of anger as a constructive and productive tool in social movements. So thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Um, Julie says that she's learned something critical from each one of you and she's thankful. Any, any comments or questions give you, um, especially those of us who haven't gotten the chance to speak, uh, which is you know, the three of us, what, what um, comes to mind or especially if there's things I want to talk a little bit more about this or I want to struggle with an idea or take it in a different direction or reinforce it, so. Any thoughts? And you can also put them in the chat if you would prefer. It also could just be something that strikes you. Well, I, can I say one other thing just sure. in, the, in the absence of other things? Uh, this expression of rage as a privilege was is a really, I think a really interesting and um, interesting way of thinking about this. And a lot of the work that I do in social change is democracy building through encouraging voice and agency. And so um, that process of encouraging people to develop their voice and to feel that they have agency to express their voice, I think is so much the work of, um, of social change education, you know, like working in social justice education, regardless of what platform you're on, whether it's health disparities or um, racial, um, racial impl implications of racism, um, whether it's gender um, expression, you know, there's all these different areas. And, um, and I think that the, in keep it, it's very much in keeping with Maisha Cherry's um, list of five actions to figure out how we can support. And Joy, you said this so beautifully of like how you, how you support when people do, are developing their voice, even if it's um, a fledgling effort, how do you support them in doing so in a way that, um, that encourages that expression, so. Thank you, Amanda. I'm saying in the chat, Hero says, I find that outward anger and discussing topics makes things more difficult. The other side rarely listens to you and you tend to get more defensive. So how do you balance rage with calmness and understanding? And this question is for anyone. So Shayla, oh, Shayla, perfect. I, I would say, um, and I'm reference, I'm gonna reference another book. So I'll post that in the chat too. Um, but the book is called How to Have, no, it's time to talk and listen. How to have uh, critical conversations when discussing like race, gender, sexuality, things like that. And one of their key points that they start off with is that when you're having these conversations, it's important to stay grounded and centered in your why and in the values of why you're having this conversation to understand that first, we have to think about the, the situation, the context. And if we, it is that we are expressing our harm, we need to think, well, what is the purpose of us having this conversation? Um, for me, being a Black woman, I'm always thinking about how am I presenting myself? I'm fully aware that for me to act in more of those traditional or stereotypical anger responses, the, you know, directness, um, assertiveness, um, maybe a little bit of volume, tone, things like that. Yeah, I'm going to be very easily perceived and dismissed as that angry black woman. And it's frustrating, even when I'm feeling angry, to have to be mindful of how I'm expressing it. But when we center ourselves in our why, when we are attending to our healing and our self care, we are able to channel that anger in how we express it. So, as I said, like I have a lot of anger and I put it into the work of my research that I'm doing as it relates to anti-racist programming. And for me, that's healing. So I express my anger through my healing and through my resistance. So I'm maintaining my space while also acknowledging my why. I'm angry, I'm pissed off at racism, but I'm using that critically 
and finding a way that will bring me healing while also still expressing myself in those ways. So that would be my initial response to that. And I'll put that book in the chat too. Thank you, Shayla. I have that book on my shelf. It's very helpful. Um, uh, it, I just, I really appreciate what you said um, in terms of thinking about focusing on your why and the purpose and having that purpose guide you and to be centered in that why. Um, it, your question is a really good one here on, I'm really glad that you're bringing it to our attention. So we get a chance to hear from, you know, after me, Amanda, and then anyone. One thing that comes to mind for me is there's so many ways to intervene. There's so like that uh, pluralizing emotions, also pluralizing how it gets catalyzed into the world. And I tend to, and when I was saying this feminist killjoy is this figure that's that I really am holding on to, it's partially because I have deep socialization of being kind and gentle to everyone. And yet I also am just like going to build on Shayla's. It's like, I do have this deep rage as well, you know, because we have all of our emotions. We all have these, right? And the parts that I've been allowed to express actually are just a piece of me. I'm going to do one more Audre Lorde story because I love her discussion that I, I don't know if you know Shayla or Amanda, but she talks about butter. And a long time ago, butter didn't have, it had a pellet that would, you'd, you'd squish and then it would get colored throughout the whole um, butter. And so you'd have to massage it. And so I think it, and what she meant by that is to say that if we deaden any part of ourselves, we're deadening all of ourselves. And so, so finding creative ways of expressing that rage does not mean that that happens in my conversation with Amanda after this. <laughs> no, I mean, not that I have any anger, but there's, there's so many ways to intervene. And so to reclaim anger doesn't mean that we respond in angry ways at all times, at all, right? Um, and yet it is thinking about that claiming of that source, that purpose that Shayla was just speaking of, that can give us the energy to say, you know, it is worth it for me to continue. So my rage might be expressed in saying I'm getting up and I'm doing this, even though I'm not quite sure what the result is going to be, right? So it really can be expressed in a diversity of ways that feel authentic to you. And, you know, if it is, I'm angry, you're angry, and it gets escalatory, kind of this deconstruct or this, um, unconstructive rage that Amanda was referencing, you know, yeah, that's not, that's not going to take us on a road anywhere. I mean, it's going to take us on a road of releasing stored up emotions. Um, so anyway, I hope those thoughts are useful to think about. Uh, and perhaps um, Amanda, and then anyone else that has thoughts. I just want to say that, you know, in conflict resolution work, we talk a lot about self-regulation as being so central to how we are conflict resolution professionals. And so I've been struggling with thinking about self-regulation in concert with rage, because there's a way in which you can be completely self-regulated and enraged, right? It's like, like Shayla said, it's like being really like at peace with your why doesn't mean that you're not still able to perform the rage that is also true for you. And it's like this very, it's counterintuitive in a certain way to hold both things simultaneously, but it is how we do the work. If we are like, flipped out and enraged, we may not be as strategic as if we are in a spot in a, in a spot of self-regulation, but it's still the rage that lever that mobilizes us or gets us moving. So I realize that that's a little bit of a cognitive dissonance, but I, I encourage you to think about it and maybe even reflect on when you have you could even think about it as righteous versus self-righteous rage, you know, like when you're when you're um, from a neurobiological standpoint, when your lid is flipped, when you're not tracking, uh, that's not a great time to use your rage as a, um, as a motivator. So your rage is what mobilizes you to find the self-regulation to enact the rage maybe is how I would describe it. And then the other Andrew, thing- Oh, go please go for the second thing. The second thing I was just gonna say was just going back to that, like is the intention of your rage to blame or to hold people accountable because mm -hmm. those land so differently on the people that you're trying to invite into change. And so to when, when, when people perceive the blame, there is zero receptivity. And I think that's what Shayla was describing in the um, anti-racist training she was going to. But mm -hmm. when people are invited into a shared accountability, it's amazing what can trans be transformed. So yeah, Joe, sorry. 
Yeah, alongside that discomfort that happens in that transformation, that messy work. Um, when you're speaking, Amanda, I was also thinking about bringing in the collectivity of this. And so it is so helpful to get into groups, um, you know, uh, 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 women of color really know this, women's groups in general is like get together and you talk, uh, this is enraging me. And so you don't have to be resourceful there because you're in a space where it's just like, I, I have this shared rage. And that is a really good way to reflect on how the precision of that rage will be used. And so to find home spaces where it's just like, here we go. You know, I'm going to let this, I'm going to express this in a way that is more likely to be held so that I can then in a collaborative space, consider the, the precision of how I might take that towards Shayla speaking about towards your purpose. So really finding collective places where you can express this needs to be expressed and recognizing that in some places that mess of expression useful and there's places for it. And so we can, and I'm particularly thinking like doing that in the home spaces we have, and then in coalition work, then we can be more precise about the ways we want to use our anger as a force for change. And I will just add Please. in everything, what I'm learning is to show yourself grace through it all. Show yourself grace as you continue that depth of self-exploration Show yourself grace when you attempt or when you do channel it, show yourself grace when maybe you could do things a little bit better or differently. Like really, I mean, when we think about the harm that we are experiencing, what we're fighting through, what that means for us day to day, we're human, we're not gonna get it right every time and that's okay, but it's a learning process. And as we get this feedback, that's how we can refine ourselves and, and get better at it. But um, allow yourself to be angry, allow yourself to heal and be fully present in that process for all the ups and downs and in-betweens and in and outs that that will be. I think that is, that is also true. You can't heal if you are not allowing yourself the grace to get messy, make mistakes and try again. That's part of the process. Beautiful reminder, Shayla, thank you. Linda writes, missed some of the presentation and hoping to watch the entire recording later. I'll let her know that you've recorded it, Amanda. Um, just thank you so much for talking about this. Have been feeling so much shame about my anger rage working in medical industrial complex and often wonder how others stay contained. But I know my experiences of anger have been clarifying, so this helps sort through it. I love that you're pointing out how anger can be clarifying, a source of information, and that we are not encouraged to imagine it as such, right? Especially in the medical industrial complex, you know, I, you know, we're just really not encouraged to be our full healthy selves that Shayla is inviting us to be, right? Because these kinds of institutions are just like, you know, contain us in ways that aren't healthy. Um, I'll respond briefly. There's one thing that, because, you know, kind of that whole um, fractal practice that I was talking about. I know for me, um, I need to unearth my anger and, and find places that feel safe to do that. And it actually is something that I've, that I've been recognizing more. And it's because again, I've socialized to be nice and socialized to be supportive of others' needs. And so, and that anger, um, Thich Nhat Hanh really helped me understand this, but it's a common metaphor of like, uh, if you ask, you can shove whatever it is that's an outlaw, you know, whatever it is that's an othered in your experience that is your shadow, you can push it down, right? He uses a metaphor of a house. So you put whatever is not part of you that is welcome, that is outlaw, that is not encouraged to show up into your basement and he talks about um, there's no there's no way that that's going to be covered. And so what's going to happen is at the most inopportune moment, somebody comes to the door and that basement of whatever you put down there is right there in the living room. And I, I, it's such a useful metaphor for me because it reminds me to do my work. You know, as Shayla's really been emphasizing, do my own healing work. Um, and, and in collaboration with others, my house is not a single unit. I need home space, you know, and, and we all do to learn how to make our anger more um, precise. Um, but so that's what comes to mind a little bit when it's like, instead of shame, in fact, shame is the exact thing that makes you put it to the basement, right? It's like, hide this from the world because that should never show up. And, and, you know, we're fully human. And so we're of course going to have anger, especially for awake to injustice. 
And so to hold shame of that is exactly what the status, those that love the status quo would love us to feel ashamed of our anger. And so just show up when you're able to like behave. <laughs> so, so that shame, I just, I honor it. And I also encourage you to think, what is a way that I can work with that? How can I bring that up and expose it to sunlight? You know, because shame doesn't work in sunlight. And, and that can also include our, um, our human response to anger and particularly to the injustice we see. Yeah, I would agree. When, you know, it struck me when you said you wonder how others stay contained. We don't. We don't. We have our outlets. We let it go. I know I do. Okay. I, and I have my little safe spaces and how to do it. But don't let the small, calm smile. I'm doing the work. Okay. So I'm enraged. I let it out. And then I show up and I show out. And then I let it out. And then, you know, so um, that that's my authentic self says, don't just take this and say, oh, she's, she's processed through it and she's fine. No, she gets triggered. She's traumatized. She gets re-traumatized. Okay. But in that healing process, I'm able to really try to take that step back and manage it and express it in a socially acceptable manner. And sometimes, you know, we need some good trouble. So sometimes we are going to stir that pot and that's okay too. It's how we decide to use it. Yeah, just thank you. Um, really appreciating all of this. Um, and I think I'm just thinking of like a particular incident and in my job, I'm the bioethics chairperson. And so I think that idea that we're supposed to be the ones that are contained and that have the answers mm -hmm. and that we are the conflict resolvers, um, you know, in the particular instance that I'm thinking of, like, I just, I felt like it was such an impossible scenario and it was a pandemic situation and there were no family members around and there was a journalist who was inserting himself into the scenario, which is just such a new and different and crazy experience for us. And I, I got really mad at the media person. And I said, this, this journalist has to get out of here right now. And I got in so much trouble at work and it was just several hours of them telling me that like, this is not appropriate and you can't be this way. And I just felt like, God, if you only understood how terrifying it is to be in this moment and what it means to try to like hold all of this. Um, yeah, so it was just, I felt so terrible because I just felt like, oh my God, I, I let everybody down. But because of that, I had so much clarifying around what my job is and what it's like to do this work and what it means to actually stand up for patients and do advocacy. And, and I guess what the corporate machine tells us is like the right thing to do is sometimes the opposite of that. So, you know, it, it was just very helpful. Um, and hearing this is also just really, I think, affirming to, you know, because then you have to also overcome like the reprogramming of like, oh, you didn't do it the right way or whatever it is. So yeah, I appreciate that and um, enjoy the idea of like being with your shadow self. I think that's actually one of the main ways that I processed it. Um, and it was helpful. I have some good friends who really helped me through that and helped me understand that. So yeah, thank you so much. Beautiful. I, I love that you're talking about the clarification and, and when we, when we claim our shadows, you know, and anger and shame, our shadows for many of us, we're claiming power, you know, we're claiming that we're for all of us. I'm going to read one more thing and then um, move to a conclusion. Um, atomic bomb survivors set a goal of abolition of nuclear weapons, and they have been working hard. A survivor said that she doesn't hate Americans and she hates war. Thank you. Do you want to say more? Is it Kazuyo? Can you help me? Yes, uh, Kazuyo Yamane from Japan. Uh, it's almost 7 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> uh, sorry, so I couldn't attend this from the very beginning. And it would be nice to have a chance to have the recorded session, this session, because I missed so much. <laughs> I got up at 6 o'clock and <laughs> noticed uh, you know this I, I just want to say that there's a peace monument in Hiroshima 
my father was an atomic bomb survivor. And the monument says, uh, let's not repeat the same mistake. There is a discussion argument. Well, we should blame the United States. Uh, other person said, no, Japan invaded other Asian countries also. And in China, so many people were killed in Nanjing, etc. So, you know, sufferers of war uh, hate other, uh, you know, enemy countries. Yeah, but I think uh, it, it, like uh, Hibaksha, atomic bomb survivors, it's necessary to set a goal, as Amanda said, and work hard for peace and human rights. Thank you. Beautifully expressed, thank you. So I'm gonna invite people in the chat to just say one thing very briefly, a, a phrase or a thought that you wanna take with you from our session. And then Shayla, can I invite you to read those with me? Um, and, and I also invite Amanda and Shayla and myself to do that. But what is one thing that you're gonna hold on to um, out of probably many different, say that again, Shayla? In the chat, anger is possibilizing. Thank you. You can also speak it. Rage is normal and an okay emotion to feel and can even be beneficial, says Hero. Thank you, Hero. I'm going to remember to think about my why, my purpose, as Shayla has reminded us, when I think about how to respond and use my anger for change. Well, I just want to thank for from all of of us appreciate all of your uh, presence and uh, what a pleasure to be doing PGSA and hopefully we'll be able to see you in person next time and uh, meanwhile really appreciate your participation and thanks from everyone uh, Amanda and Shayla maybe we can stay on for a moment